So um, we are now moving into the, the final session. My name is Katrin Brun. I'm a deputy director at CLS for research. And um, I'm uh, stepping in for Professor Yonga Khan, who's uh, unfortunately had to um, uh, travel because of a family illness. So in this um, uh, session, we have uh, three speakers and uh, a discussant. So it's uh, Professor Lawrence Aber from um, uh, the uh, uh, New York University. Uh, it's uh, Shane McLaughlin from uh, uh, the FCDO. And uh, we have Professor Hilary Kremin from uh, uh, here from the Faculty of Education. And then we have uh, Lilian Diab, who is uh, um, uh, professor at the Lebanese American University. So we will have a, a mix of uh, online and on-site uh, presentations for this. And um, uh, we will give the floor to uh, Lawrence first. Can you hear us, uh, Lawrence? And can you also, can we hear you more importantly? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, that's wonderful. So I'm getting um, a bit of an echo on my side. You're getting an echo. Maybe that's because our sounds are on. So we will turn our off uh, for you to, to talk. Um, okay. And do you want to share your screen yourself? Or is uh, I, 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 I had asked if a person there could advance. Yep. Okay. So I will give the floor to you. The presentation will come up on the screen. And uh, we will take it from there. <laughs> Terrific. I'm still getting that terrible echo. Sorry, I'll mute us now and share our screen to your PowerPoint. Thank you. Do you all hear an, hear an echo at all? I still have a very happy. Dis disruptive echo on my Maybe you have put back on the sound to communicate with me. Lawrence, hi, this is Rachel from Beirut. Uh, we're dealing with a technical issue, but it seems it's from your end because everyone else is muted. So maybe you want to lower your uh, your volume if that helps at all. Let me see if that works. Well, can you still hear me okay? Yes, we can. It doesn't eliminate the echo, but it makes it less pronounced. And I never had this. Anyway, I'll just muddle through. Um, first of all, my name is Larry Aber, and I'm a professor of psychology and public policy at NYU. Um, I've been working in the education and conflict and crisis sector for only 10 years, although, as you can see from my visage, that I've been working in uh, academia for 40 years. <laughs> so. I did most of my work in the first 30 years in the United States and most of the work in the last 10 years uh, in low income and conflict affected countries. Uh, I wanna join everybody in congratulating Maha for the chair uh, and FCDO for the wisdom of, of creating the, the bilateral chair. And uh, I am going to begin by saying, I'm probably gonna come at these issues that are somewhat uh, orthogonal angle from the conversations in the first two sessions. That does not mean that I disagree with the cogent critique of uh, the existing education and emergencies industry that were mounted over the first two. Um, but I probably am a little associated with what Mario Novelli had to say about um, we, we don't want to both recognize the critique and recognize the progress and positivity where it exists. Uh, uh, so that's, that's my intention. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. 
can sorry. someone bit of difficulty oh me... i can i can advance it i'm sorry i apologize okay sorry, so I... i'm wearing two hats uh, a private uh, scholar hat and a hat as being the research director of eric eric is the education research and conflict and crisis and protracted crisis research program funded by fcdo one component of that are the two bilateral chairs, one of which is Maha's. Uh, another part of it is uh, a component that focuses on original research in seven countries. And the, the countries are in uh, cohort one, Jordan, Nigeria, and Cox's Bazaar area of Bangladesh. In cohort two, it is um, Lebanon, Syria, South Sudan, and Myanmar, all enormously different contexts and conflicts. The program of research, as the colleagues mentioned earlier, was is going to last about six years, and it's based on, very much on a bottom-up and coordination uh, uh, model. We're spending the first inception year with both cohorts, really constructing a country specific research agenda led by stakeholders in the countries. And we're spending the next three or four years pursuing those research questions, analyzing and sharing findings. We're uh, just at the end of the first inception year for cohort one. And uh, I wanna point out two people in, in uh, excuse me, in. Cambridge, who, uh, Shane McLaughlin, who's gonna follow me in speaking, and Salim Salama, who are uh, able to take questions uh, about Eric after the presentation and are very centrally involved in it. <clears throat> Excuse okay. me, Lawrence, sorry, this is Rachel again. Um, do you mind if you can take off your earphones and unplug it and then just speak directly from your laptop? That reduces the echo quite a bit, if that's okay. I just did, and you're right. Well, it, it does a little bit. If it, does, if it does on your end, it's terrific. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so the Eric Consortium is uh, uh, members are three global partners, the International Rescue Committee, which is leading the, the entire consortium initiative, uh, Overseas Development Institute in the UK, and New York University. And New York University is the secretariat for the research director of the consortium. And everything I'm about to say is uh, attributable to me, not, some of which is shared by Eric and some of which isn't. Um, I'm not gonna belabor what many people have mentioned. Why are we at this point? There's a huge uh, set of needs out there in the world. The uh, most vulnerable kids are not getting adequately served. Uh, there's a need to increase our investments in a wise way. And I think we both will agree with those two. The third point. Sorry, Professor uh, Abert. Um, sorry, just interrupting you for a second. Can you tell me where we should be on the PowerPoint and just remind me when to change the slide? Because I don't think that we're matched up with what you're saying. Hold on. I apologize for interrupting. Um, let me let me get out of that. Uh, I think the echo's gone now too. No, it's not. Um, if you go back uh, to the second slide, that's uh, where we should be right now. This one? Sure. Or this one? No, no, no. You were right, the third slide. Okay. Um, I, I was. It, Great. Sorry I really about. apologize. I don't know what the echo is. Um, I'm seeing now the sound is very weak and far. Um, maybe I should, maybe you should go to Shane and I should exit and 
come back in and see if that helps. But I take your, I can also just uh, rush through this and, and do the best we can. What's your preference? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just see. The third point, the existence of an overwhelming lack of evidence on what works to ensure quality education for all kids. Seems to be a point of contention today. Some people feel we know what works and it's the political economy and lack of political will and uh, uh, biases of multiple types that prevent us from implementing what works. And there's others who truly believe that we, for the scale of the pro problem and the issue, the, the uh, amount of evidence we have is very minimal. Uh, next slide, please. There, uh, what I wanna talk about in my few minutes left is why a conceptual framework? We, we've been developing a conceptual framework to guide our research. And it's based on the premise that simply generating more evidence is not enough to drive meaningful changes in policy and practice, if you could keep clicking. So uh, there are so many topics and issues and phenomena under the general heading of education and emergencies from the need for cultural adaptation and identity, uh, accelerated learning programs, language education, uh, uh, its intersection with other domains, policy domains like child protection and political economy. Simply generating more evidence in these, on these siloed issues is not likely to drive meaningful changes in policy and practice. Next uh, click. You add on top of that, that those phenomena are being investigated by over a half dozen, probably a dozen different academic disciplines, each with their own uh, language, their own focus, et cetera. What there is, is in a way, a Tower of Babel effect. The, the people of Babel were instructed to build a tower to God, but they were cursed with every single person having a different language and no way to translate. Next slide. Um, so then what? If, if more evidence uh, and, and just more disciplines doing the work isn't going to do it, then what? Next slide. Uh, the, the, we want to combine research from various disciplines and contexts on a wide range of topics with, next click, um, really beginning to, to try to identify and focus on the main mechanisms of learning and development that could be the targets for action. By intervention, I mean action to disrupt the system that exists that is not adequately serving kids. Uh, next slide. So we, we have three basic purposes of why we want to develop a conceptual framework at the front end of this six-year enterprise. The first is to organize the extant evidence that does exist. Uh, if we could create a truly multidisciplinary frame that allows us to organize the research from all those different disciplines as they exist right now, we believe that would be a useful purpose of a conceptual framework. The second purpose of a conceptual framework is evidence building, to identify new phenomena and ask new questions that might not be apparent without such a conceptual framework. And the third is over time to make the transition from evidence organizing and evidence building to the use of evidence and decision making, which uh, I know is a very contested set of issues, but uh, uh, I think that's what policy is all about. Next slide, please. So uh, at the center of our um, conceptual framework are four drivers of learning and development. Uh, ac children's access to uh, educational experiences. And by access, we don't mean just attendance, but we mean awareness of and capacity to participate in education opportunities. The second is the quality of the education experiences. And that isn't just... Uh, uh, per people expenditure or uh, years of uh, experience and education of the teachers. It's the quality of the multiple resources, relationships, norms, practices, 
and interactions that affect children's learning experiences. The third is continuity. Some people um, uh, combine continuity with access. We do not uh, because it's different systems and different processes we suspect. And continuity has to do with a sustained exposure to education that allows progression in both learning and schooling. And that sustained exposure is especially challenged in conflict and crisis contexts. And then finally, coherence. Uh, probably many of you know the work by Lant Pritchett and his colleagues in the RISE uh, framework, framework. And we are uh, quite deliberately um, borrowing his notion of coherence, of alignment in goals, processes, and arrangements among the various stakeholders to pursue an outcome in education. But we're e expanding it and challenging it in two ways. Uh, he, he said coherence for learning outcomes, meeting literacy and numeracy. And we're saying, no, it needs to be also um, uh, uh, holistic uh, children's learning, uh, the, the kind of learning of morals, the learning of emotional uh, uh, well-being that comes with that. And um, the second difference is that we don't believe that coherence leads directly to these outcomes, but they go through uh, the, the drivers of learning. So next click, please. This is a very uh, um, abbreviated uh, but essential form of the ERIC conceptual framework. As you see, we place access. It's, it's organized in two ways, top to bottom and left to right. Top to bottom is from the uh, policy systems level to the local systems level. And left to right is kind of direction of influence, not, not always perfect, but uh, direction of influence. And um, at the very center of, of this conceptual framework and the two things that we think are most actionable to understand and perhaps change are the level of coherence for access quality and continuity at the systems at the policy systems level and access quality and continuity itself where the rubber meets the road and the kids are in communities. Uh, uh, they lead to both policy outcomes like alignment and accountability, but then to the children's outcomes uh, ach achievement, but uh, in, in both traditional academics and in uh, holistic learning and equity in those. Next slide. Is there a delay on, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you, they, go back to the last one, sorry. So um, the, the conceptual framework, uh, it, can, it becomes a, a way of also thinking then about uh, the role of interventions at the policy level and at the local level and, and how they may interact with each other. So um, we're going to be um, providing a 20 or 25 page working paper uh, describing this conceptual framework by the end of this month. Um, we are eager to share it broadly and we're very eager to get critiques. This has already gone through three or four different rounds of extensive vetting with people in country, uh, um, uh, globally, academics, uh, practitioners, um, and um, but it, it has not gone through the kind of vetting that uh, this morning's conversations would recommend. So we're very eager to, to do that uh, with colleagues and welcome your, your uh, critique of our uh, framework and uh, welcome your continued interest in the progress of the ERIC proposal. Uh, Final question, uh, this talk was subtitled, uh, how can policy, how can uh, transdisciplinary research, which I hope I made the case for on education and conflict, uh, how can policymakers use that transdisciplinary uh, research and the conceptual framework undergirding it? And for me, uh, conceptual frameworks prioritize things as well as deprioritize things, deprioritize things as well as prioritize things. This puts central focus on uh, the sources for lack of access, quality and continuity, and what we can do about it. 
and the policy changes that would be required to improve access quality and continuity. Uh, I'll leave it there and apologize for the technical problems. Thanks very much. Thank you so much and thank you for asking this uh, important question about how do we as knowledge producers now also influence uh, policy. Um, we rem can you hear us? You can't hear us now. <laughs> I don't know if it's us or somewhere else. Um, we're unmuted and our microphone is on. So yeah. Mm. I don't know why. No. We can hear you in Lebanon. Mm. I'm not sure Lawrence can hear us. Yes, because he's turned down the volume. <laughs> um, Lawrence, can you hear us now? No, he can't hear us. I think um, um, we will move on and we will come back uh, in the discussion. Maybe we can uh, send him a message on the chat or something sure. in the after. But we will move on here uh, with uh, Shane McLaughlin, and I hope I'm pronouncing the, <laughs> the surname <laughs> correctly, uh, who's the uh, uh, Education Research por Portfolio Lead at FCDO. So I guess you speak at the other level of the ERIC project somehow. Uh -huh. So the floor is yours. Thank you all this morning. Um, yeah. Where? That's very little. I'll stand. No, um, <laughs> oh, perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, this, I'm actually sorry. I might stand because I'm blocking out everyone in the room here. So if that's. Don't worry, we'll do it later. <laughs> I think maybe just easier to stand and see the room. Um, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. You're okay. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much uh, all this morning. Uh, my name is Shane McLaughlin, um, as was introduced, and I uh, head up the education research team at FCDO. Um, previously, I've been an education advisor overseas with uh, FCDO and formerly DFID in both Kinshasa and Kabul. And many, many moons ago, I was also a teacher. Um, so a broad range of experience in education, uh, also in kind of conflict and protracted crises. Um, but I will put my hand up and say less so on the education research front and in research in general. Um, so I do put my hand up. I'm not from a research background. However, um, I did grow up uh, raised as a Catholic in Northern Ireland um, from a small Irish community. And I think for me, uh, working for the British Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office uh, creates all types of identity issues and questions uh, that I get asked myself. My family certainly asked me, and uh, as do my community. Um, growing up in Northern Ireland uh, was my first experience of conflict, uh, growing up during the Troubles, and also questioning that identity, and also, to an extent, colonisation. I think that raised a lot of questions for me uh, as I was going through my career, and somehow that ended me up here. Um, but like I say, I'm a teacher by background, um, so not a researcher, and as you'll notice uh, from the introduction sheets, I don't have any letters in front of my name, and I'm not here today to present a paper. I wouldn't insult you by doing that, because I don't have those. But let me tell you how fantastic it has been this morning just to sit and have a morning out of the office where I get to listen to fantastic researchers producing excellent work. It's very few mornings that I've been this excited, um, this emotive, um, and also just questioning a lot of beliefs and views that I've been able to just busy myself with uh, during the everyday uh, run of life. So I think, yeah, excited to be here. I think good research um, should really be in pinning all the work that we do. And I'm very fortunate to come back um, from working overseas into the research department that is heavily focused on how do we do our work better, what is working, and how do we then inform the wider workings of foreign policy for the UK and development, as you all know. Um, that's why, again, we're delighted here to be uh, promoting the ERIC programme and delighted to be funding the bilateral chair with Maha. So a massive thank you, um, and we look forward for many years working together. Um, Maha today asked me to reflect a little bit on uh, the issues that uh, have been evolving within FCDO, um, the current thinking and approaches to how we support uh, countries dealing with conflict, 
and also how we work uh, in education and in refugees. Uh, many of you who've worked in this field much longer than uh, myself will know of the origins of FCDO and where we currently are today. And for whatever your beliefs on how we got here, um, I think from my experience, having experienced both departments, I feel that it was born out of an intention to ensure that our political work, um, our diplomacy, is also acknowledging and recognising the importance that we have to deliver development effectively. And to do that there, we feel that we need to work together internally with our diplomatic colleagues and our development colleagues, but also through uh, partnerships globally with many, many partners. Um, sorry. Um, we, as, as again, many will know, the UK has a very proud record of global leadership on international development, and we have supported tremendous amount of progress over recent decades, not least uh, to Lebanon, as my colleague Judith was announcing earlier today. And our aim has been to improve people's lives, to tackle poverty, to provide life-saving humanitarian assistance, and help countries to become more prosperous, the unfavoured word resilient, um, uh, it's uh, a tainted word in our organisation, as I'm sure it is globally these days, um, but also to secure um, that people have the ability to live a safe life. And for me, that has been very much delivered through our work in education. And I've seen that firsthand through our work in Kabul and Kinshasa. Um, it was mentioned earlier, I think, around the idea of uh, the politicalised uh, notion of working with girls in Afghanistan. Um, and I think that is a very real challenge that we need to be open to. I think from my experience of being in Kabul, our work was very much directed by listening to communities, listening to girls, and similar to refugees, as was uh, said earlier on today, one of the key things that they're constantly asking for, despite uh, the context that they're living in, is an education. And so through that, uh, our work in uh, Kabul, we're looking at ways that how can we help achieve that? Um, for the girls who were demanding education in rural areas in Afghanistan. Um, secondly, I think um, I want to address uh, the kind of wider challenges that we do face. And uh, I think we are in facing many multiple crises globally, not least a learning crisis in education. Um, but I think globally, uh, many other crises um, from war and from a foreign policy perspective. The UK yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Better? Yeah? Okay, uh, I will continue. Uh, how we are able to achieve that is in partnership. In partnership with uh, institutions globally, north and south. Leaning on institutions um, and large funds such as the Education Cannot Wait, the Global Partnership for Education, and influencing their strategy and their direction that then reaches much, much more people than we could ever do alone. The new international development strategy builds on the foundations and tries to give direction on our future priorities. We cannot do everything, and we certainly cannot do everything well. Um, but what we can do is try to prioritise and build those partnerships where we can have the maximal impact um, on education. Within that, international development strategy is two key pillars um, that I think are applicable today in providing women and uh, girls with the freedom that they need to succeed, unlock their future potential, educating girls, supporting and empowerment, and protecting them against violence. And secondly, providing life-saving humanitarian assistance um, to prevent the worst forms of human suffering, um, prioritizing our funding and driving more effective international response to humanitarian crises and education crises. We only make that more effective if we are driven by the research that underpins how to do that effectively. Um, so these are policies, they are not approaches, and nor do they outline uh, plans on how we deliver that. Uh, these are broad public policies, but the work on how we deliver those 
uh, with a lot of the research ethics that we've discussed today, with a lot of the considerations, is for my team um, and for the people that we work with through projects like Eric to design. I think today has been a fantastic day for me, least of all, uh, taking in a lot of that information and knowledge from partners to you here today, and we're very much open to that moving forward. Um, that also comes with the reality that we do face practical challenges, we do face prioritisation, and we also need to make tough decisions. And where we do that, and when we do that there, we want to ensure that the research is guiding those decisions. My role uh, in FCDO, working in the research and evidence department, is to ensure that th those, that research that we are conducting is informing those policy decisions. And that's why we look to projects like ERIC, we look to opportunities like the bilateral chair to inform our thinking in terms of where our future planning and programming goes. So I will stop there, um, but yeah, just again, a massive thank you. Um, we're very open, uh, we're very proud to be supporting ERIC and to be funding the bilateral chair with Maha. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, we are just looking to see if the next speaker is here or not. <laughs> right. Um, it, yes. In the meantime, I thought so because I thought one uh, one of the one of the things that we are really struggling with as researchers often as well is how do we inform policy and what kind of um, processes. Um, can we do better on both sides to actually see that there is a connection between the, the research, the knowledge, and, and policy? And I was thinking that, in a way, this is where we are heading towards in the discussion that has been during the day. So it would be interesting to also hear more about those kinds of reflections, perhaps. And yes, please. Uh, can I just say, Larry, just message to say that he can't hear us. So wondering whether ah, it is so I think maybe. Yeah, maybe we, is it because he turned down the sound? I texted him to ask if he can check that, so he must have checked that. Okay. I think it must, must be from our end. Well, it could be his headphones. If he has an odd configuration, he's uh, on the speaker, but he has sent the whole mic. Let me tell him to check that. Right. <laughs> so, um, I think we, we will hold that question to the, to the discussion as, um, as uh, we have, uh, have now our next speaker here. We are very, very happy to have you here, uh, Hilary. Hilary Kremin is, uh, uh, I understand, the new head of uh, Faculty of Education. It's wonderful to have you here today. So we are celebrating the chair and the new head uh, is here as well. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Are you happy to jump straight in? I am very happy. Okay, please do do come. <laughs> just just here. Tell me when I'm. Uh, is that is that okay? Yeah, good to go. Lovely. Well, first of all, can I welcome you all here and uh, also welcome this very important initiative and uh, extend my huge congratulations to Maha for getting this um, established and. Um, I will be with you for what is too brief a time in order to uh, share some thoughts with you that I hope uh, may well be useful. And I look forward to hearing uh, how the conversations continued for um, the rest of your time here together. So thank you, Maha. So um, what I'd like to share with you is the ways in which I've been taking forward the positive piece uh, in schools programme. Um, my work, which you may uh, or may not know about, is um, built around the field of peace studies. And it takes some core concepts from peace studies and from international relations and applies them to the field of education. And uh, I started this work in 2017 with um, a PhD student of mine, Terence Bevington, and we wrote a book called Positive Peace in Schools. And more recently, I've been revisiting the framework. And what I'm sharing with you today is brand new. It's a new iteration of, of this work. Uh, and I'd be really interested to hear your ideas about it. I've uh, presented it for colleagues as part of Cambridge International, Cambridge Interna um, Assessment. 
and their schools internationally at their, at their conference in, uh, in September. There's been a lot of interest in this work, um, but I would really like to, to get your feedback on it with uh, the sorts of context that you're thinking about in your own, in your own work. So to go, to go back to the beginning, uh, positive peace, what, what, what is that? And uh, why, uh, what would negative peace be? And why do we want positive peace rather than uh, negative peace? So I'm dra drawing on the work of Johan Goltung, who was the first professor of peace studies in Norway in uh, the 1970s. And he was challenged to think about how he might define peace. Now, um, he decided that he couldn't define peace without thinking about violence. And that's, that's interesting in and of itself, uh, isn't it? Because if we were to be in India or China having, having these uh, discussions, or if we were to be talking to uh, First Nations people in uh, Canada or America or Australia or New Zealand, we probably um, wouldn't have to think about conflict and violence when we were trying to define peace. Because um, in traditions such as Buddhism or um, Taoism or um, Hindu traditions or yogic philosophy or in uh, First Nations traditions, peace is harmony and balance. Um, we can all think about images such as yin and yang and so on, which help us to understand peace as a holistic concept. In our European tradition, our word for peace, Pax, comes from uh, Pax Romana. It's, it's, it comes from Latin. And it kind of means cessation of hostilities. So peace for us is the gap between war and between hostilities. And this is the concept that Johann Goltung was starting with. So um, he thought, well, if peace is the absence of conflict and violence, how do we understand violence in ways that help us to begin to theorize about peace? And so he started to think about direct violence and indirect violence. Direct violence being uh, the kind of violence that, that we all imagine when we think of the word. Um, so attack, episodes of violence. Um, more recently, by the way, people have started to talk about fast violence and slow violence. Um, Nixon has uh, written a book in, in 2021 about um, slow violence being much less dramatic than the kinds of episodes that we might see of fast violence. And yet so much, um, in many cases, so much more harmful. We can think about the violence that comes through climate change and um, through some of the, um, the harm and the more long-term effects that we might be seeing in the world, which perhaps don't hit the media, don't hit the news, because they're not quite so dramatic as, as the fast episodes of violence. But Goltung thought that indirect violence might be violence and harm that comes through uh, structures and cultures. So the way that we organize our society, the way that we organize our institutions, and um, he started with the concept of structural violence, and he then, later in his career, added the concept of cultural violence. So structural violence would be um, the fact that some groups within society do better than others. Structural violence might lead to migration, might deal to um, harm, death, um, early, um, uh, early death and um, to um, what the World Health Organization would talk about as uh, people suffering from neglect, harm, not doing as well as they could do. We often don't think about violence in those terms, but it's important if we're thinking about how to tackle conflict and violence, that we actually do take account of these more um, indirect forms of violence. So cultural violence is uh, the way that our cultures organise themselves in such a way that structural violence becomes invisible to us. So what Goltung said is if we want to tackle direct violence, 
we can do, but all that we will achieve is negative peace. And um, from an international relations point of view, we achieve negative peace through peacekeeping efforts. So you can all imagine parts of the world where the blue helmets are in or um, where we're keeping warring parties apart. Uh, there's no actual episodes of violence, but the minute that the constraints are taken away, the violence is going to start again. And um, when you start to apply this to schools, when you think about educational um, contexts, we can see that very often people's response to uh, conflict and violence is peacekeeping. So we have CCTV, we have high fences, we have locks, we have barbed wire, we have proliferation of rules, we have isolation units, we sit people facing the wall, we keep people apart. These are forms of peacekeeping which will only ever result in negative peace in our schools. If we wish to achieve positive peace, we need to tackle structural and cultural violence. And we do that through peacemaking and through peace building, which are different from peacekeeping. So peacemaking happens when a conflict has occurred and we bring people together to make the peace. So peacemaking is reactive. In my work, I have looked to try to get schools away from punitive and adversarial models of peacemaking and into more community-oriented, collaborative, restorative methods of peacemaking. And so in order to achieve that in practical terms on the ground, we might think in terms of peer mediation, where we train young people to mediate play playground disputes. We might think about moving from punitive language in schools over to restorative language, which is using questions such as, what happened? What were you thinking and feeling at the time? What have you been thinking and feeling since? Who's been harmed by what you did? What are you now going to do to put things right? Okay, so we're looking to educate our whole school community, adults and young people, to be conflict literate, to know how to take responsibility, how to restore balance after harm has been caused, how to take responsibility, how to work together. So peacemaking initiatives in schools are about moving from peacekeeping and punitive methods over to collaborative methods of discipline and um, conflict management and conflict transformation within schools. The last one, peace building, is where we look to create a climate and a culture in schools so that the methods of peacemaking that I've just mentioned are able to happen and so that destructive forms of conflict don't happen in the first place. So schools who are using these methods who want to work towards positive peace are functioning at three different levels. They're looking at the, the non-negotiables about safety and human rights and where peacekeeping is unfortunately necessary. We're not, we're not throwing that out altogether but then they're moving to look at what they're doing in school to educate young people to manage and, and to, to, to train and support teachers to manage conflicts more creatively and, and more collaboratively. And then they're looking at what they're doing in school to create capacity to make this more likely. And the more recent work that I've been developing is looking at the different scopes for this. So we've been thinking about um, this peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace building being rows in a matrix and the columns are inner peace, outer peace and, rela and per interpersonal relationships, community and global and lastly ecological. 
So you can see that at the um, intersections of each of these, there are areas of activity that could be suggested for schools in order for them to begin to, to um, audit and develop and reflect on what they're doing in order to bring about positive peace. We've been working with Cambridge Assessment to create a measure so that um, against each of these there are descriptors that anybody in a school community could um, answer on so that schools can get a snapshot of the, their conflict and peace within, within their school. And we're also looking to develop a raft of activities that schools can do in order to begin to move along that spectrum in order to move more away from negative peace and into positive peace. Um, I've probably used up my time. Um, I, don't, don't want, I don't want to go over, but um, that, in essence, is the work that I'm doing at the moment. If you're interested, I'll be more than happy to follow up in conversations with you uh, about it. Would you like me to take a couple of questions? Or? I can come back towards the end. I've, I've, I need to. I've got something that um, is occupying me at the moment. That I have to go back to. Right, but so um, let's open up for a of okay. Okay. So people are getting into discussing noise and ventilators. Yes, that's <laughs> fine. That's absolutely fine. If there are any questions, then uh, perhaps you could forward them to me, and yes, I can. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, and uh, you're well, uh, there is one question. Oh, did I? Yes. Hi. Hi. Oh, thank you, Udai. If I can ask you, so this uh, conference discusses a lot. I think uh, you need to come to the microphone, so uh, maybe <laughs> you can. <listen. laughs> Sorry, Udai. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, uh, Hilary. So uh, my question is that this conference uh, discusses a lot um, the context in a, in a conflict zone, yes. which is a bit more complicated maybe than schools' yep. context. If you think of a, of a conflict zone, do you, do you still think that the peacemaking uh, keeping, sorry, keeping, making a building mm -hmm. also work in that complicated mm -hmm. context or there might be other kind of layers or other kind of activities that we should do in between to bring those uh, different parties who have very strong tension and, and hostility between them mm -hmm. to have um, the things that you mentioned such as restorative justice. Yeah. So just a reflection on conflict yeah. zone yeah. Would, be, would be great. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Udai. Um, I would say uh, yes, in many ways this work is even more important in, in conflict zones. Um, there need to be additional sensitivities, particularly around uh, perhaps peacekeeping, and the INEE conflict se sensitivity framework is very useful for that in terms of protecting basic human rights on the ground and making sure that surrounding violence isn't being replicated through the school system at the very basic level. But um, in settings affected by armed conflict, it's even more important that young people have capacity going into the future to know um, how to use language and structures that make um, peace, successful outcomes from peacemaking more likely. I, um, the, the work that I'm doing, uh, as with many people here, is on the interface between uh, psychology and individualized um, skills and, and techniques and then on the other hand more social and structural factors so we're certainly not saying that peace can come in the world if everybody is simply trained in how to use the right techniques absolutely not but neither are we saying that the structures are so powerful that people on the ground don't have agency and there's nothing that they can do in order to make uh, small contingent changes which could add up to something more significant. Um, and so 
I think this is a useful framework for schools in um, settings affected by armed conflict. And um, I, would, I would urge people who have opportunities to develop this work to talk to me and to think about how we might begin to research doing precisely that. Um, I, I, I'm interested in the way um, that you're situating violence, and I'm wondering if you're understanding it in political, economic, and um, externally formulated cultural or social terms, and how you might understand gender-based violence mm -hmm. and school-related gender-based violence and those processes mm -hmm. that are at the interface yeah. of the personal yeah. and the political. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, obviously, there are that, that kind of violence can quickly move into direct violence, can't it, in terms of um, significant abuse within sexual abuse and, and so on with, with it, within settings. But that kind of direct violence is um, triggered and made possible because of structural and cultural factors. And so the framework that Goltong introduces enables us to make that explicit. I think one of the things that he was, one of the reasons he introduced these concepts was because very often when a violent act occurs, it's the perpetrator who is the focus of our efforts. Whereas very often it's the perpetrator that's at the end of a very long tr chain that has produced that episode of violence. And if we can understand the long chain that's led to that incident, um, it's, not the, it's not just the perpetrators who are called upon to change if we wish to address violence with it, within cultures. And so, you know, we, we, we see this in Iran at the moment, don't we, that... Um, that the violence is, is within the way that repressive structures have made people's lives very, very difficult. Um, the actual episodes that are happening are a result of something which is much wider than those individuals um, involved. So when we're thinking about how we might, um, how we might galvanize our efforts and how we might prioritize what we do, some of those efforts will need to go more upstream in order to begin to think about what we might do more systemically, as well as just focusing on the actual uh, incidents themselves. <laughs> okay, I can't say no to you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, just following up on, on your question, I was thinking, I mean, there's, there's a lot of critique on LRP's education yeah. and conflict. And, and, and Do we, as researchers or academics, have to actually focus on the structure? Because in, in some ways, we want to have a lot. But I'm just wondering, I mean, what's the new thinking around that? And how yeah. could we, as scholars, engage in this? Yeah. I think we have to have hope, don't we? We have to believe that we are here to do something. And um, one of my PhD students, Tim Archer, his, his mantra is, walk the talk. And so it's about the way that we go about things. It's about the decisions that we make about who we will collaborate with and who we won't collaborate with, how we will speak to people, the sort of language that we use, where we put our efforts. Is it to our own careers and to our funders and to our promotion prospects? Or do we have uh, some time and resources to put into our participants? even if that's not necessarily going to bring us glory or going to further our, our, our other aims. I really do think that all we can do is be the best researcher, the best educator that we can be in, in any setting and work with other like-minded people on the ground to bring about the change that we believe in. The structures that are surrounding us sometimes feel like it's impossible to be able to tackle them. But um, if we don't form new collaborations, if we don't try, if we don't stand together for what, what we believe in, then it's, it's all game playing. 
and ultimately um, we may as well give up. You know, Foucault said you look for opportunities to disrupt. I would go beyond that. You look for opportunities to, do, to disrupt and you look for ways of doing things differently. Okay. Thank you, thank so you much. very much. Uh, thank you for sharing this with us. And uh, in the true spirit of the chair, we are now moving to the Lebanese American University uh, and uh, Jasmine Lillian uh, Diab, who is uh, uh, Associate Professor at Lebanese American University and she's the Director of the Institute of Migration Studies and a very dear colleague of us uh, at LAU. So over to Jasmine for uh, um, the discussant role uh, here. And I hope we uh, will see uh, Jasmine. Then. Oh, there we go. Um, funny enough, when I was invited to serve as a discussant, I was told I was going to be part of a panel. Um, it's a little bit more of a one-man show, but bear with me. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Dr. Maha and Dr. May for the invitation. Um, I'm also a very uh, proud fellow of this very important chair. And I think um, I will go over a little bit of discussion points and a little bit of a debrief of what we've heard today uh, and also talk a little bit more maybe into the discussion and how we can orient the discussion a little bit more uh, in the Q&A. Um, the chair's most important work, um, in my opinion, is really not only its ability to inform policy, but also break narratives simultaneously. We're talking about policy development through shaping narratives and breaking narratives. And I think this interlinkage was very clear throughout all three of the interventions. Um, in the first intervention uh, by Dr. Lawrence Aber, uh, what I liked the most was the discussion on breaking away from simply generating more evidence and how that's not enough to generate really meaningful change. And as we move that statement back into policy and practice, we move back to insisting that human beings are not data, tying into the different presentations that we've heard throughout the day as well. People's experiences are not data and people are not data. And so how do we move away from focusing on the numbers, focusing on what we want the findings to look like, and how do we then inform policy adequately and contextually as well? there definitely remains an overwhelmingly uh, evident uh, lack of understanding of what works. And when we talk about access to quality education for all, often enough, we lack participatory approaches. Um, we often come in thinking that we know what other people need and we know what works. We come from an informed standpoint. We come from a standpoint where we have the education, we have the funds, we have the strategy, we have the plan. And then we circle back to the need for more of a participatory approach there as well. And I think uh, the first intervention really highlighted that quite well. Um, we do need to disrupt the system that exists certainly. And I find that to be a very strong statement of the intervention as well. But disrupting the system immediately and, and with force is not always necessarily, I would say the best way of navigating it. And so as we talk about evidence-based decision-making uh, and the intervention highlighted the need for a unified vision, I would love to unpack that more. Uh, what do we mean by a unified vision? How do we explore a unified vision? And to what extent is a unified vision participatory? And what do we really deem participatory? Who's taking part in the discussion? How much effort are we making to make people take part in the discussion and to be as inclusive as possible as well? particularly when we talk about people's access to education, but their access in general to different components to their quality of life. What I liked the most about the first intervention was the link between access and quality, because it's often not so much about who has access to what, but rather who has access to proper quality. In Lebanon, and I, I think of Lebanon whenever I give my comments and, and my discussions as well, we talk about the ability of different refugee groups, different vulnerable groups to access opportunity. We say they have access, but what type of access do they have? And what do they have access to? What is the quality of education that they have access to? Moving back to our understanding of data, is it how many people have access? How many people are in classrooms? How many people a program reached? Or is it really the quality of education that these people are getting as well? 
it was very refreshing uh, in the second session to hear uh, the FCDO talk about resilience. I thought uh, it was a beautiful focal point as well of that presentation and how we need to challenge that definition. And so as we discuss education and policies surrounding this uh, specific subject matter, this really requires us to break the narrative and overcome terms that compartmentalize different groups. Uh, not just compartmentalize them, but frame them in a little bit of a permanent state as well. When we talk about resilience, we talk about resilience as though the discussion stops there. And for many people, when you label them as resilient, as though it's a permanent state of being, this stops the discussion from moving further and stops the discussion um, at resilience and being resilient, as though being resilient indefinitely is some kind of a state of being that people are bound to. And so uh, I found that to be uh, quite a main center point of, of the discussion. Um, certainly partnerships are important, but most importantly, I think uh, the realization that donors can't really do everything. Um, we have been throughout today challenging this understanding of a top-down approach uh, and how it remains really highly ineffective, uh, specifically when we come to the realization that education and conflict is intersectional, uh, it's layered, it's gendered, uh, and it's a very complex landscape. And this requires us not to just address policy design in education, but also simultaneously address other policy concerns that either directly or indirectly impact education. Talking about policy on the political, social, and economic levels, and how this has fed into vulnerability in certain settings, how it's fed into the ongoing conflicts and whether or not they come to an end and what this means for access and education in conflict settings as well. The third intervention uh, discussing a point on positive peace, I found absolutely fascinating. Um, and I, I liked the way the presentation talked about how it drew from core concepts of peace and saw how to apply them. I'd love for us in the Q&A maybe to unpack this and not just talk about applying them, but talk about also contextualizing them. So contextualizing them to different contexts, to different conflicts and to different groups as well. When we talk about conflict settings in a case such as Lebanon, or we talk about vulnerable groups, when we say the word refugee in Lebanon, we mean so many different groups of people. So I would love to unpack in the Q&A and maybe, you know, for the room as well, for different panelists to talk about contextualizing what that means. Um, I also like the point on how the, the speaker discussed using violence to understand peace, uh, the slow versus fast violence component. Um, in my class with my students, we talk about drivers and triggers. We talk about something that starts really, really slow and really, really gradual for a long period of time and ends up doing much more damage than a trigger. Um, and I found that to be one of the strongest, I think, interventions of that. Um, the point on negative peace through peacekeeping efforts, and I think I'll leave it there because I'm also aware that we, we've gone over time. Um, to tie this back to our discussion, um, how much of our humanitarian landscape and the humanitarian context that we operate in um, is containment and how much of it is a durable solution? When we talk about keeping a population resilient, what does that mean? And when we talk about patchwork in the areas of responses, even in the areas of access and especially in the areas of education, what does that mean? Because as we discuss structural violence, the word access goes hand in hand with this concept, and that's particular to education as well. Um, I think I'll leave my, my comments there. I'm aware we have just a few more minutes. So uh, please direct your questions to the virtual screen in front of you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Jasmine. Um, and I think there's a lot of provocations in what you're saying. And actually, we haven't heard this word of solutions much in this uh, seminar, even though we're talking about refugees. So that's also quite interesting to bring that in, I think, towards the end. We have a little bit of time uh, for um, 
reflections, questions, uh, both to the current panelists, but also I think for the, for the rest of the day. We have a few more minutes of, of the day before we can meet outside for a reception. So um, I would like to open the floor, and I, I don't know how this works with online and Beirut and here. Um, hopefully there is also um, some um, interventions um, in both, both places. So would be very happy to have any reflections or questions uh, that, and I rec we can gather a few if there are uh, more. <laughs> yes, so I, I will let you start and I will also see if there is, and we have also one online from James, so James, I'll, I'll uh, let you come in a uh, second, but uh, let's, uh, let's go to Ricardo. You can stay there if you want, it's up to you. You can speak there. Um, yeah. I'll be quick to pass my, the, the uh, opportunity to James. Two, two important uh, or, uh, questions. One for Lawrence, I think it's, it's important that if we're moving in and taking the first presentations that we heard from Maha and Mario and from the presenters from Tejendra and uh, from Light, I, I think what we're saying here is the importance of bringing the type of evidence that doesn't exist, and Maha put it very beautifully, you know, 80, 90% of the evidence is not getting the voices that you want to capture. So any framework that then is fed through that evidence is likely to then reproduce the same evidence that exists. So I think we should take that very much in, into account. And the second is just to kind of put something out, out there. Uh, a student of ours here, uh, two students, ba Basma, Hay well, three students, Basma, Hajir, Sara Clark, Habibi, and Omisha Kuran, uh, really engaged with the concept of resilience. They wrote a beautiful piece called The South Speaks Back, exposing the ethical stakes of dismissing resilience in conflict-affected contexts. And I think they problematize from their own perspective what this resilience is and what we are grappling with. So again, these are the kind of thoughts that we need to bring at the forefront. These are people really speaking back. So just putting those two things out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will come back to the panelists uh, at the end, but I will also invite James to, to come in. Uh, James, very nice to have you with us today. Yeah, no, um, thank you for having me. Great to see you on the, on the screen, Catherine, and, and thank you. Thank you for facilitating this uh, this virtual uh, connection. Great uh, congratulations to, to Maha and, and and everyone involved. It's so exciting to see this off and running. Um, I do not have a background in this field at all, so this might be a, a very uh, a very ignorant question. But in hearing uh, the panel and in seeing the material in the lead up to this event, I'm quite struck at this really significant area of activity of of policy and. And, and of fun that we see at a global level uh, with UNHCR's uh, Education Alliance, with all of the focus on, on refugee education that we saw at the Global Refugee Forum uh, in its first iteration, and the excitement about refugee education being an area of engagement and funding for the Global Refugee Forum in 2023. And, and I, was, I was very struck with this, you know, the, the, the very rich um, uh, material that that has been presented here of research activity that's happening, uh, and this notion that 80% of the evidence is not being used. And so um, my question is really for the peers uh, that we've heard and, and for others in the room, uh, has there been any engagement with the uh, Education Alliance, uh, with, with you and Geneva, initiatives such as the Together for Learning initiative funded by the Government of Canada or Education Cannot Wait. Um, and, and with this imperative of ensuring that, as, as, as Yasmin just said, that to ensure that, 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 that it's not this top-down approach, is there a willingness, an appetite, are there steps being taken to bring this evidence into that global policy realm? Or is the sense that that global policy realm is self-referential has its own interests and is uh, it, it is best avoided. I'm just I'm curious about where the thinking is on potentially engaging with that global policy field. So great to be here and, and thank you for taking my question. Thank you so much, James. Uh, I think um, are there any questions in Beirut? Uh, I can't see any hands. Yes, there is one. There is one. Okay. Uh, 
Hi, this is just a, a general question really um, for any of the speakers or, or any of the panelists from throughout the day. I'm struck by the commonality um, between humanitarian work and policymakers, between uh, programming designers and implementers, and between research um, in terms of the trajectory between uh, all those things being done to refugees, to being done with refugees, to being done by refugees. I'm just curious to know if anyone on the panel has any observations about where they think we are on that trajectory and also think realistically where we might actually be able to get to, given all the constraints that we've heard about today. Thank you so much. Um, I think I will uh, um, move to uh, ask presenters to maybe reflect on the question. So Lawrence, the first question was for you. Can you hear us? And did you hear the question? And would you like to come in? I can hear you. And I think that the echo is gone. <clears throat> and uh, that's terrific. Uh, thank you for the questions. Um, I, I'd love to hear Maha talk a little bit more about how if the frame uh, goes through existing, organizes existing evidence, doesn't it import the biases and, and of the existing evidence into the frame? I think that's absolutely right. Uh, but I, I'd love to hear Maha's reflection on it too. Uh, what to do about that, I think, involves uh, being highly reflective about that and very broadly consultative about it. Um, and then on the question about... Uh, uh, ...folks between researchers and issues, I, I think that's very, very important. We we have it at our. Oh, you're breaking up. Uh, I I'm afraid. With the governments of Peru and Colombia. Are you hearing me? Uh, you are breaking up a little bit. Uh, I can come back to Hello? you in a little while. Um, yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure we can hear you now. <laughs> can you Sorry, hear me? Uh, you you hear were me? breaking. No, uh, we can't. So we're uh, moving on. We will come back. I'm to sorry. You. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was wondering um, uh, if anyone had any uh, reflections on on James's uh, question. For example, Shane, did you have anything on the uh, the work with some of these alliances that are? Um, being established, and would you like to speak to that? So, yeah. yeah. Do you want to? Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, again, I think we touched on it that, like, no man or country or woman uh, is an island, and I think in a lot of the work that we do, you have to work in partnership. We have to reach out and find out where people are and uh, learn from people who have experience in, in their own context. The ways in which we can do that there is by developing diverse platforms that have opportunities um, for policymakers to engage with material. I think often, particularly in the research field, we can get quite technical um, and in terms of making that relatable to a policy decision, uh, it doesn't happen. Um, and so I think making sure that whenever we are producing very high level, very technical, but very worthwhile research, that it is synthesized in a way that can be approachable and accessible for wider audiences beyond uh, academia, if we are wanting then the uptake to really um, kind of be felt at those other levels outside of. <coughs> um, some of the ways that we do that there um, through Eric is uh, developing the um, steering group uh, of kind of ad ad experts in the field of education research and emergencies. We have other platforms on more broadly what works through the development of the GEEP panel, um, the Global Evidence in Education get the acronym. Advisory. Advisory Panel, thank you, Celine. Um, and, and bringing in global expert, not just, uh, not just UK expertise, not just Western expertise, but looking across um, ensuring that there is full representation um, and ideas and generation coming from all areas that we work. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. And I think that is uh, following up on, on the next question uh, about where are we at when it comes to doing research uh, on, with, or by refugees. And I wondered if anyone wanted to talk to that question. I think it's a very important one in, in the discussions that we've had today. <laughs> well, well, I mean, we, we work, we try to do something together, I'm not sure where Elaine is, but we try to do something. But I think, generally, I think, the, I mean, many initiatives are, that are done by Syrians are illegal anyway. So if you're in Lebanon, you can't even say, I'm a Syrian NGO, um, because you can't exist. You have to register either in Geneva or Belgium or whatever, and you have to perform under the table. You can't attend many of the meetings. Um, so it's... It's difficult as well to even find these initiatives. Still, despite that, they do exist. Some of them, we have a project now on refugee-led initiatives in Lebanon, Jordan, oh, Turkey with James, uh, uh, and in, in, in um, West Africa, and we're trying. But I think what made it more difficult is this kind of like, um, the favoring of humanitarian agencies to partner with the host states. So the bargain is, okay, well, we'll have to stick with the state because otherwise they will kick the refugees out. Um, so the least of the two devils is just, you know, we please the host state at the expense of the refugee led initiatives. And I think this, this has been one struggle. And I think what is interesting, I was talking to my colleague, Ruben Abed, who is our colleague in Jordan, who's leading this project, and she told me, oh, what's so interesting by studying um, these initiatives is refugees always want transnational um, uh, projects and programs and provisions. While humanitarian agencies and other organizations are emphasizing national uh, initiatives and national frameworks, I think this is something for us to think about. So we are obsolete, you know, we're doing the opposite of what refugees actually want. I'll help you. This is something for us to, uh, to think about. I also wanted to ask, I mean, the question, uh, James' question, I wanted to ask Mario and Tejendra and other colleagues, how do they engage with the policy? I mean, how easy it is for us to actually access public sectors. I don't know how you find it for me. Yes. Um, yeah, your thoughts are welcome. Um, yeah. Um, is it okay to talk from here or? Yeah, you can talk from there. Just speak up. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that um, policy actors shouldn't be understood as monolithic. You know, the, uh, I always think uh, Poulanzis talks about the state as being a social relation. And I think institutions are also like that. But, you know, it depends on moments. And my own feeling is that there are certain moments when things seem possible and you can talk about things. And there are other moments where things get closed down. I think we're in a moment of closure, I have to say, at the moment, globally, around these issues, rise of xenophobia, rise of the right. It's not a very easy moment to talk about some of this stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean there are not people inside those institutions who would like to open up those discussions. And so the question is about relationships then. No? I mean, my early experience of engaging with policy was with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, early 2000s. But it came at a moment when the Dutch had made a commitment to spend 20% of their budget on health and education. And the relationship came to an end when the new Dutch government said, we're not going to fund education anymore. That's a political thing that wipes out our thing. So it shows you the way that, you know, we do have agency, I agree that. But our agency is constrained by a range of factors, and we try to intervene in those factors, but sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully, no? And that's why I say, shouldn't be just policy makers, should also be social movements, because social movements can create the conditions under which policy makers change. And there are moments when we should put more energy into the grassroots, I would say now, yes. and less energy in policy makers, and other times when the conditions are more fertile for governments to listen. So, you know, we have limited agency, we have limited energy, so the question is, how do we operate strategically at certain moments? No? So, uh, I guess, you know, my own career is, I started in movements, went into the policy area, got burned, <laughs> went back into movements, no? and probably I'll go back into policy, but it, it it is a it is a tricky terrain, and we shouldn't underestimate the challenges of that. 
I agree. And, and actually, this is why one of the pillars of the center now is social movements, because we feel like this is a very good entry into the teacher's world, which we don't, you know, as a, as a movement. Yeah. Now, just studying them as participants. Jasmine wanted to come in. Okay. Uh, to generate, wanted to say something? I think yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, just two quick points, I think. Um, I mean, having started my work with um, NGOs and INGOs over 10 years or 15 years now, um, I don't think NGO-led development or response works or even enables sustainable change. What really sustains change is the social movement-led, political movement, grassroots rising and creating those pressures and changing those political structures in favor of the demands raised by those, those communities. Um, so I think that's a very, very important thing to recognize. And, and how do we build that allyship with the uh, movements and, and resisting communities? That's probably a better way of doing it, but obviously it's not an easy thing to do for funders or FCDO or other, other institutions. So I think that as a researchers, as academics, we can comment on that. Many other colleagues working in NGOs might not be able to say that, yeah. even though they realize it, right? I think that's the privilege that we, we have, thankfully. Um, the second point, I think, is this idea of policy um, that we were discussing earlier as well, is that we need to come out of this state-centric idea of policy formulation and policy implementation when states are hugely dysfunctional and broadly oppressive. Um, and I think about you know, some context of Myanmar where lots of ethnic education departments which are not Burmese education state but there are states themselves protected by their own ethnic armed organizations, they've got their own department, their judiciary, in some places they have their own tax systems and everything. So th those could be other spaces, like refugees are in doing incredibly good work in, the, in lots of places in Lebanon, in Beka, we, we work with lots of, um, you know, we can't say that, but maybe Lebanon, you know, refugee-led NGOs with that we know. And, and there's a lot policy um, scape being created and we need to be looking at those spaces as well rather than thinking all the time from very macro level top down policy uh, I mean there is a study uh, sorry I'm speaking out of turn now <clears throat> go ahead <coughs> we'll there is go a, back. I mean there is a study, I, I've forgotten the names of those authors, but I can look up, when at least 3% of the critical mass of grassroots resistance resist, policies change has happened, is what their study has said. Now, uh, when I look at it in India, I mean, uh, the farmers' resistance, which allied with labor movement and allied with anti-Muslim uh, kind of resist, uh, the anti-Muslim xenophobia kind of solidarity group that's fighting against that. And so the, uh, the regime had passed three agricultural laws, would have, it would have made it possible for the UK and some of the other people to take a lot of food out of India and there's further staff of uh, a lot of population locally. Farmers' resistance put up a very strong face, and it took one year. They stayed on the street. Millions of people supported it. Media here doesn't report all those resistances. That's a different matter. But government couldn't implement. Second citizenship. They passed an anti entirely discriminatory citizenship. Now millions of people came out on the street, and they haven't been able to go ahead with implementing it nationwide. So completely agree with my colleagues here. Uh, at the end of the day, change is laid by people who suffer from it. Thank you. We're now going to move to Jasmine and David. If I can. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. I mean, I think it's a little bit uh, delayed, um, my, my comment. But on the whole question of, of refugee-led, um, I think a lot of our discussions that we have on refugee-led organizations uh, is linked to um, how accessible they are, uh, to what extent refugee-led organizations really reveal themselves 
Uh, we've done work in North Lebanon in areas such as Tripoli and Akkad on the feminist movement in this area and how participatory it was. And a lot of the conversations that we have with feminist organizations center around them not being able to access these organizations for multiple reasons, of course, associated with how legal they are or how they are able to register or not. Um, so I think the question of access and them kind of operating, I would say, on the down low in general in a lot of areas, um, there are certainly exceptions, but I mean, this is our experience, I would say, in, in Tripoli specifically. Um, and I think we also need to keep kind of this narrative in our minds also that refugee-led organizations are also civil society organizations that have donors. Donors have priorities. To what extent is a participatory approach adopted in the way donors approach refugee priorities as well? Uh, a lot of the organizations that we've spoken to that operate as well kind of in this gray zone in Lebanon or in Syria have also highlighted the fact that donors have very much of their agenda as well. So I don't think refugee led is just the golden term here. There are so many other factors to consider as to whether or not we're working with refugees, you know, to go back to that question, or whether the work is really by refugees themselves as well. Um, I think that was, I think the only point I wanted to add on that. It's a little bit late, but uh, thank you. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Jasmine. I think it is a very important point because it's also about these partnerships that we talked about earlier. Who counts as uh, partners that we are allowed to work with in, in different types of funding? And I think that's really part of this uh, uh, question uh, because a lot of the refugee-led initiatives, for example, do, do not they're not uh, uh, credible, they're not uh, deemed accountable in, in terms of funding, etc., and therefore it's harder for us to also work with some of those. So there are structures that can easily be changed, I think. So that's a very important point. So sorry, I use my chair privilege here. <laughs> but now to the real chair. And uh, Maha, do you want to say a few words? Uh, Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Uh, Thank you for the team in Lebanon and all the Mesa, Rachel, and the comms, everyone. I can't even run Maggie. Thank you so much <laughs> for giving up your day and staying with us. Uh, last minute notice. Thank you. 